Hello, welcome to today's class. We're going to start up chapter 11. At this point, we're going to leave behind mechanics, which everything we've done so far can be classified as, and jump into thermal physics, aka temperature, heat, and that fun jazz. Before I get into chapter 11, uh, we are approaching the end, so I just wanted to kind of make sure we're on the same page. Um, this week, we're going to cover chapter 11. On Wednesday, Tomok 10 is due. On Thursday, Lab 13 is due. Next week, the first week of May, we will do Chapter 12. That, yep, that's right. Um, homework 11 will be due then. Lab 14 will be due then, which will be the last lab. And I will hold an optional review session outside of the class. I'm going to spend the last week of classes, because next week is the last week of classes. I'm going to spend it all three days in lecture lecturing, but what I'll do is I'll hold a review session. You can come to it if you want. If you don't come to it, I'll record it. I'll post the video just like usual. It just won't be during the normal class time. Um, I haven't sent this email out yet, mostly because they haven't announced when the finals are going to be yet. They haven't given the final exam schedule. And I was kind of waiting till I had the final exam schedule to send out the survey for the um, for review. So that's fun. Uh, hopefully, I'll get that soon. I'll let you know as soon as I get it. Um, of note, your Chapter 12 homework, since Chapter 12 is being done the last week of classes, that homework is going to be due on the 9th, which is a Sunday. I fully acknowledge that's a dick move on my part, but I'm doing it anyways. So that's the setup for the rest of the semester. Um, any questions with that? Okay. So, as I said, this chapter, we are going to cover thermal physics. We're going to start thermal physics. Really, this chapter and next chapter are parts of thermal physics. If we were to keep going, um, the, ne the one after would be thermal physics too, but you know, semester is only so long. Thermal physics is the study of temperature and heat and how they affect matter how temperature and heat will change things, edit them, and mess with them. Um, really, this chapter is going to be how temperature affects objects. Next chapter will be how heat affects objects. That's the general idea. Now, thermodynamics is based off the laws of thermodynamics, which on my opening slide, making fun of it, um, it has a bunch of laws, and if you read the title at the very bottom, there's a zeroth law too, but it's like a confusing right off the bat. We're actually all going to start with the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The zeroth law of thermodynamics is one of the dumbest laws that exists. If you don't understand why it exists, it like, just seems really stupid, but isn't very crucial. And it says, if object A and B are separately in thermal equilibrium with a third object, C, then A and B are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Bringing that to a final point, says if A and C are the same temperature as each other, and B and C are the same temperature as each other, A and B are the same temperature as each other. Now, this seems really like a dumb sentence, but here's the thing. People were defining temperature and talking about temperature before they knew what temperature was. That the saying, OK, it's right now in the 50s outside, we know what that means, but you don't necessarily know what's physically happening, the physics behind temperature. And people understood hot, what is this is hot, this is cold, long before they understood the physics behind it. This is OK, so I'm going to continue. Um, we just had some bunch of Zoom issues. Um, 10 minutes later, I'm back in, more like 15 minutes later, I'm back in. Um, and I'm going to continue. I'll splice the beginning of the videos together. So there's, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a weird cut there. Uh, what I was talking about was thermodynamics. The general idea is that people decide, were able to recognize things are hot or cold or what temperature was doing. They were able to recognize this fact before they understood what was going on. And so we they created the zeroth law of thermodynamics. That's if object A and B are the same temperature, and object B and C are the same temperature, then object A and C are the same temperature. And basically, it's a way of saying that temperature is a uniform thing, that all things at 60 degrees are the same temperature, and so on. That's the basis of it. 
You see, when you say two things are in thermal equilibrium, that's what you mean, that they're the same temperature. And it's kind of great because the definition of thermal equilibrium is in the same temperature. Really, it's more complicated. The definition of thermal equilibrium is the same amount of thermal energy. But temperature is defined as the property that decides whether or not things are in thermal equilibrium. It's very backwards circular logic. And the reason why, once again, is because people have been measuring temperature for a hell of a lot longer than they've known what it actually means. Here's the general idea. What temperature actually is, is the average energy of the particles that make up something. That if it's hot out, it means that the particles of air are moving quickly. If it's cold out, it means the particles in the air are moving slowly. And because people define temperature before they knew what atoms were, people have made many different scales, like Fahrenheit that we use in America, where water freezes at 32 and boils at 212. Celsius, which is where they use everywhere else, where water freezes at zero and boils at 100. And Kelvin, where water freezes at 273 and boils at 273. We're going to be using mostly Celsius and Kelvin, but I'll get into those in more detail. Um, the main two temperature units, though, Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now, Fahrenheit was based off a of salt water brine. Zero Fahrenheit was when it froze, 100 Fahrenheit was when it boiled. But really, the basis of Fahrenheit was it was based to be based around how people feel. That zero is very cold, 100 is very hot, 50 somewhere in the middle. It's just supposed to kind of match feelings. Now, as a physicist, we kind of say, fuck feelings. We don't care about such things. We want hardcore math and science. And that's where Celsius comes in. Celsius is based off water. Zero Celsius is water freezes. 100 is where water boils. And most of the world uses Celsius because water is so important to life. It's still kind of arbitrary to use water. And, you know, not like oxygen. We all use that, too. But it is a water is so crucial to life. It's easier thing to base it off of. And so, yeah. Um, most people can use either one. In this class, we will use Celsius. Once again, it is a little more scientific. And also, if you remember way back when from chapter one, this map. Most everyone else uses Celsius but us. So we will use Celsius in this class. Um, for those of you who just got in, um, I'm only like two slides from when I kicked everyone out and Zoom crashed. Um, but the video will all get posted. Now, here's the thing, though. These two units have different zero points. See, most of the time we do a unit conversion. If I convert feet to inches, or pff, inches to centimeters, I'm holding a ruler. If I convert inches to centimeters, zero inches equals zero centimeters, equals zero me meters, equals zero light years, equals, it's all the same. But because people made temperature scales, before knowing what temperature was, it has different zero points. That zero Celsius is not zero Fahrenheit. Zero Celsius is actually 32 Fahrenheit. And because they have different zero points, unit conversions are a little more complicated. And you can actually like set it equal, say if zero equals 32 and 100 equals 212 and make a conversion. And you actually get the conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit go as follows. That anytime you want a temperature in Fahrenheit, you take the temperature in Celsius, multiply by 9 fifths and add 32. If you're in Fahrenheit and want Celsius, you subtract 32, then multiply by five nights. That is the conversion. Questions? Now, here's the thing. Celsius is more commonly used, but it's still kind of arbitrary. Um, It's not based off what's physically happening. Kelvin is the scientific version. Kelvin is based off the actual what's going on. Because I said before, what we view as temperature is how fast molecules are moving. Well, at zero degrees Celsius, molecules are still moving. Zero Kelvin is the scientific scale that zero Kelvin, known as absolute zero, is the point where the molecules have no energy. That zero Kelvin is when everything is stationary, frozen in place, not moving. Now, in general, it is a theoretical temperature. It's never been reached. Even space is four degrees Kelvin. 
I used to do research of things at four degrees Kelvin at that temperature. Um, oxygen is a solid, which is a pain in the fucking ass. But I know people who did ke- temperature at the milli Kelvin. We've gotten down to the micro Kelvin in real world, like 0.00001 Kelvin. I don't know if I did the right number of zeros. Five zeros and a one. But it is the idea that is actually what's scientifically important because it matches directly to the energy of the molecules for the temperature. Now, the nice thing about Kelvin is they made the size of the steps the same as that as Celsius. You see, the conversion between Celsius and Kelvin is just that the zero is different. It's just that zero Kelvin is negative 273 Celsius or 273.15 something to be more precise. But the and what, but the size of the steps are the same. If you increase the temperature of something 10 degrees Celsius, that's the same as increasing the temperature of something 10 degrees Kelvin. And it makes the conversion very easy. To convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you add te- 273. To convert from Kelvin to Celsius, you subtract 273. And that's it. Any questions though? Let's do some example problems. The book Fahrenheit 451, it's about a lot of things, but about, well, let's go with censorship. It's one of the things. It's so named because 451 Fahrenheit is the temperature paper bones. It's a little more complicated than that. Ray Bradbury was American, so he worked in Fahrenheit. Let's say Ray Bradbury was British, because why not? What would he have named the book? AKA, let's convert 451 Fahrenheit to Celsius. If you want to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's not a simple unit conversion like everything else. You need to use one of the equations I gave. If you want to convert 451 Fahrenheit to Celsius, you just plug 451 for T sub F. You subtract 32, multiply by 5 ninths, bring it to sig figs. 451 Fahrenheit, oh sorry, Fahrenheit 451 should really be Celsius 233. Make enough sense? Now, if you want to do the same thing in Kelvin, if you want to do the number in Kelvin, if you want Kelvin, Kelvin is just Celsius plus 273. Or in this case, 233 plus 273, which is 506. Okay. Oh, come on. I just got my internet connection is unstable. If I disappear again, I'm just going to give up for today's class and I'll post this video later. I'll post the video one way or another. Now, when we measure temperature, whether we're measuring in Fahrenheit, Celsius, or Kelvin, we do so with a thermometer, right? Classic thermometers, like the one there's a picture of, old school thermometers. How they work is they use a material that changes properties when temperature changes. And old school thermometers are things that when it gets hot, the thing gets bigger, right? You heat up a thermometer like that and the mercury or alcohol moves up the thing as a function of temperature. And that's the general idea that temperature seems to affect the volume of that liquid. You heat up that liquid, it gets, it fills more of the tube. I mean, Modern thermometers don't work like that. Modern thermometers either use thermocouples, which is looking at how voltage, uh, voltage and current and resistance is changed by temperature, which is a physics two idea. Or um, the more common ones where people like aim something at your head to get your temperature, that measures radiation. We'll talk about that next chapter. But old school thermometers, either this type of one with a dial, is just the idea that as things heat up, the Either the liquid goes further or the dial moves. And it's because properties of materials change with temperature. And actually of note, gases will change one way with temperature. Liquids and solids change a different way with temperature. And so today I'm only gonna talk about liquids and solids. I'm gonna talk about how liquids and solids deal with a change in temperature. We'll do gases on Wednesday. And here's the general idea. If you have a long, thin, thin ball, like thin ball, long, it'll change length with temperature. 
if you have a ball, it will grow longer when it gets hotter. Now, everything expands with temperature. Solids get expand with temperature, gases expand with temperature, ga liquids expand with temperature. This equation is just for solid and liquids, though. This equation does not work for gases. But for a solid or liquid, it'll change in the length. With a change in length, how much longer or colder it got will be alpha L naught delta T. And in this equation, alpha is the coefficient of linear thermal expansion. It is a coefficient for each given material, how readily it can change as a function of temperature. L naught is the initial length at the initial temperature. And delta T is just the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Well, this can be in Celsius or Kelvin. I normally would do this in Celsius, though, because it's a change in temperature. Celsius and Kelvin will have the same values. In general, anytime you have a delta T, you can use Celsius or Kelvin. Anytime you just have a T in an equation, no delta, you have to use Kelvin. But if I was to convert delta T from Celsius to Kelvin, it would be the same value because the step size is the same. And this will tell you how much longer something gets when it heats up. Now, of note, this equation is really a simplification. Alpha actually varies with temperature. So alpha shouldn't have a set value. But the thing is, alpha barely changes with temperature. And so you don't really have to worry about it. Here's some values in case you need them, though. This is crucial when building things. If something's going to heat up, you need to plan for it. Um, jets, like really, really fast jets, at high speeds get longer. The Blackboard SO71 is a foot longer at its max speed. It's a foot longer because friction with air molecules heats up its hell. As it heats up, it grows. A Concorde jet can get 18 inches long at its max speed for the same reason. This is how a classic thermometer works, with you just have liquid in a thing that gets longer. It's just the liquid's in there, and as it heats up, it moves up the, the, the thermometer because it's just getting longer with temperature. It's also how a rotating thermometer works. If you look at an old school thermostat, or as I said, a rotating thermometer, in here would be this hunk of metal. This is called a bimetallic strip. What it is is in a coil of two metals that are sandwiched together. Two metals with different, co or different linear coefficients of thermal expansion wedged together. To give an example, right here is a bimetallic strip. What happens is at room temperature, they're the same length. But if I start heating this up, the two metals will grow longer. Now, if you look at the diagram above, brass changes more with temperature than steel does. That's a bigger value of alpha. So therefore, when it heats up, it'll get longer than the steel will. And when one side gets longer, the other gets not as long, it'll cause a bend. Because they have different coefficients of linear expansion, they grow to different amounts. They bend differently. If I cool it back down, it'll become straight again. But, but while this is heated up, it'll curve and move in a circle. That's how a radial thermometer works. It's just looking at the linear expansion of two different materials. OK? Let's do an example problem. This example problem is kind of interesting because it's going to work together um, stuff from an earlier chapter also. And often when I do problems like this on exams, I do that. What you're looking at is a railroad track that has been fucked up by temperature. Um, I said before, when you build something, you got to think about this. You know when you go over bridges, how it goes boom, 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 boom. That's because bridges are made with teeth like this. So that when it gets hot, it can expand. And when it gets cold, it can contract. And it can flex. If you don't plan for that, when it expands, it's going to go and crumple. But if you plan for it, we can get some space. It's an issue with bridges, because air passes beneath them. They can change temperature more readily. Let's say I have a steel railroad track. It's 30 meters long at zero degrees. When you normally lay railroad tracks, you don't butt them up right up against each other. But you put a little space between. The reason why someone gets hotter, they can expand. When it gets colder, they can contract. 
Let's say someone didn't do that. And this picture right here is an example of that. This 30 meter track is, this track is 30 meters long at zero degrees. What is its length if it's 40 degrees? And part B, suppose the track is nailed down so it can't expand. What stress results to the track from this temperature change? Well, if I want to find how long it's going to be at 40 degrees, I can find what the change in length is. The change in length will be alpha L naught delta T. The change in length would just be the coefficient of thermal expansion for steel, which I'd have to look up. Time, and it'll be that value times the original length times the change in temperature, which I can plug in and get a value. Now, I didn't ask what is the change in length. I said, what is the length on that hot day? If I want the new length, I'll just add the original length plus the change in length. Any questions, though? Uh-oh. I just saw a bunch of people logging in and out. Hopefully, I don't lose you all again. Are we having more computer, like, Zoom issues? I hope this is working. OK. Part B. Sorry, I should respond to this. Someone else talked to me about Zoom issues, so it's not just me. OK. So this says, um, let's suppose we nail this track down so it can't expand. Let's say we don't give it this 1.3 centimeters, but we force the track in spot. What stress would the track have? You see, we talked about stress two chapters ago. Two chapters ago, we said stress is Young's modulus times strain. That force over area times Y is delta L over L naught. And we said that stress, stress was force over area. If you do not allow something to move, the stress you can find as Y, what delta L wants to be if it could move over L naught. You have to know what Y is, and I would give you that. But I can say for this railroad track that the stress is Young's modulus times delta L over L. And plugging in those values, I can get a pressure. I can get a stress. Now, for the record, that stress, that value, is about 858 ATM. Those, if you do not allow something to stretch, if you get it locked in place so it can't grow, it will break. It is something you need to plan for when building. That's why we put gaps in railroad tracks. It is why bridges have those teeth. It's because everything will get longer with a function of temperature. Any questions, though? Oh, I'm down to only one person. This is definitely having Zoom issues. But hopefully you're watching, people are watching videos. OK. Now let's think about this. I have a long bar. It gets harder, so it gets longer. But I mean, shouldn't it get thicker, too? Like, it should grow in every direction. And actually, it boils down to really simplifying things. Because if you have a long steel bar, it not only gets longer, but it will get wider around. Its radius, if it's round, would increase also. You see, if you have a two-dimensional object, not its length won't change, but you say its area changed. And air, the, co the equation for area expansion is that a two-dimensional object will have a change in area, which will be gamma, original area change in temperature. And gamma is the coefficient of area expansion. But here's the nice thing. Gamma is just twice alpha. If you know linear expansion coefficient for something, you know the get, you know the area coefficient. But if we're going to have something change in two dimensions, we might as well do three. And any object, when it heats up, it'll have a change in volume is really what happens, where the change in volume is beta V naught delta T. And beta is the volume coefficient, which is just three times alpha. Now, I can actually make that visible. What I have here 
is a solid metal ball that in this little thing was heated up to about 500 degrees Celsius. And I can try to put it in this metal piece. And you know what? Hold on. This is actually, uh, I'm going to actually share the audio. I can try to put it in this metal piece and it doesn't fit. If I take this metal ball and cool it, and you can hear that hiss when I put it in, I'm bringing it back down to room temperature. I can find that it now fits a little better. It's a little st snug. So let me cool it down a little bit more. And now it's fitting with ease. That by decreasing the temperature of this ball, I decreased its volume. Because I decreased the temperature, I decreased the volume, it can now fit. You can see its volume change because I went from not fitting to fitting. That's just the volume causing a change in temperature. Okay. This is also how a Galileo thermometer works. This right here is a Galileo thermometer. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. It has a whole bunch of little bulbs filled with various liquids. And from each one, there's like a little tag hanging, I'm trying to get a glare, with a temperature printed on it. And what it is, is the temperature of the room is whatever in between whatever the gap is. This green one up here says 72. This orange one says 68. So that means the temperature in this room is between 68 and 72, which seems hot. Yeah, the 68 was kind of minute. It's probably pretty close to 68. The reason for that is because we know buoyancy is based off density, right? That things that sink, it's because it's more dense than the liquid they're in. Things that float, because they're less dense than the liquid they're in. Well, mass does not change in temperature, but volume does. Therefore, when you change the temperature of an object, you change its volume. How a Galileo thermometer works is it's liquids that have very, very precise volumes and very, very precise densities. And so what will happen is that they will either sink or float depending on the temperature of the surrounding. That right now, they it can get the temperature because right now this guy is at a temperature where he's sinking. And this guy's at a temperature he's floating. But if it gets hotter, this thing will become more dense and sink to the bottom. That's the general idea. OK? I'm admittedly skipping a few slides that aren't as important to make up for the lost time today. Um, but so any questions on that? Now, these equations, and really when I say these equations, I mean these ones here at the bottom of the screen, where they just divide by the A naught, B naught, and L naught. They are all for liquids and solids. Gases cannot use these equations. Gases are a lot more complicated. You see, for a gas, well, for a liquid and solid, volume is pretty set. You can't change the volume of a liquid easily other than changing the temperature. But a gas, you can readily change the volume. That if you take a gas, here, and I'm going to grab something as I say this, you can take a gas and you can compress it. If I take this balloon, I can try to squeeze it and compress the gas. Gases don't have a set volume. They can expand and compress at will. And they will expand and compress with temperature, but you can also do them in other ways. And so when we talk about gases, we're going to have to talk about them in a very different form. Now, when we get into these gases, I got to grab one other thing I didn't grab. The first thing I'm going to state is when you get into gases, you're getting very close to chemistry. And in chemistry dealing with the gases, you find a lot of people talking about what is called Avogadro's number. And here's the general idea. Avogadro's number is just a number of things. Let's say you have one atom of carbon. One atom of carbon weighs 12.01 AMU, where AMU is a unit where one AMU is the same as the mass of a proton. This man, Avogadro, whose full name, well, we'll get back to his full name, he worked out how many atoms of carbon did you have to have to weigh 12.01 grams. So one atom is 12.01 AMU. And if you have 6.02 times 10 to the 20 third, or 6020000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
that weighs 12.01 grams. Now in Avogadro, or full name, Lorenzo Romano Amadeo Carlo Avogadro de Colenta e de Solato, worked out that's how many atoms you have to have to match. And what this does is lets you talk about micro versus macro, talk about various individual atoms versus a collection. Now, this is a big number. If you had 6.02 .6 times 10 to the 23rd softballs, it would be as big as the Earth. If you had 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms, and not in a grump, but in a line, it would circle the Earth a million times. If you had 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd shot put balls, it would weigh as much as the Earth. But the thing is, atoms are very small. Each, what I have right here is four pieces of metal, and here's my my hand for scale. Each one of these has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms between zinc, aluminum, iron, and copper. The iron's very rusty. And even though they have that many atoms, they don't take up much space, right? Here's the copper one. I'm going back to the video. It's not that big. Now, the important thing here, what I'm getting with this, is we will sometimes use to talk about amount of a thing. And I've actually considered taking this bit out of this class before because this is really the only thing chemists do and chemists is dumb or chemistry is dumb. But let's say you got a dozen things, right? A dozen things mean you have 12. Because 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd is important, it gets its own number. Where a dozen means 12, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd means a mole. If someone says they have a mole of things, that just means 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Just like if I tell you have a dozen bagels, you have 12 bagels. If I tell you have two dozen bagels, you have 24 bagels. If I tell you you have three dozen bagels, you have 36 bagels. Well, if I tell you I have a mole of copper, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of copper. If I tell you I have two moles of copper, I have 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of copper. You can convert amount of things to moles in anything. We're just number of things is Avogadro's number times number of moles. Or rearrange number of moles is number of things divided by Avogadro's number. What it means, if I like tell you, we have 1.25 times 10 to the 21st atoms of potassium. You could say how many moles of potassium that is. That the moles of potassium is just the number of things over Avogadro's number. 1.25 times 10 to the 21st over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. There's the value. Side note, this link right here is what would happen if you had one mole of moles, aka one mole of the animal. Um, it's pretty gruesome, but that's what I'm going to one mole of moles. Now, in physics, we don't really use moles. We're going to talk about gases and individual molecules. I'm covering moles because I think it's an important thing to see, because sometimes you will see people talk about how many moles you have, especially when you talk about gases, that they might not tell you how many abs, how many moles. Moles is easy to measure. You see... When, this is a mole of copper. How they found it was a mole of copper was they didn't count how many atoms are in it. They figured how much it made, weighed. And with how much weigh is, you can calculate the number of moles. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about individual particles of gas. And it's basically not possible to count the number of atoms of a thing. What you're going to have to do is have it in a bigger quantity to find. And that's what the moles are good for. It's a way that you can take an actual physical thing and discover how many atoms make it up. And that's going to be what we're going to talk about is number of atoms. In a chemistry class, you use moles for most everything. In this class, we're not going to use it anymore after this, after like this slide, although it might be on the homework, there might be one or two. Because what we're going to do instead is talk about the number of atoms. We don't need to convert to some weird made up unit like moles. We can go with exactly how many atoms and use that instead but it's worth seeing to know how we get those numbers. Now, um, because I skipped a few slides, um, I skipped an example problem and two like little like, see if you're paying attention things. So um, I'm actually where I should be despite missing 10 minutes of class. 
Um, so I am just going to stop there. Um, only one of you is still in the room, so thank you for managing to survive the internet. Um, I know that there's been a lot of internet issues with Zoom today, um, but for the rest of you, the video will be up, and we'll stop there. Bye.